The following content is for entertainment and educational purposes only. It does not constitute means for diagnosis, healthcare advice, nor treatment. Make use of a qualified healthcare professional for such purposes. Let's talk a little bit about emotion. Emotion. Why is emotion important? Emotion is important because emotion, in a sense, can be the motivator, right? It almost becomes a verb, if you will. It becomes that aspect that leads you to a behavior. But it can also be a noun, if you will. It's used to describe your experience. What is an emotion? An emotion, first of all, is subjective. And when we hear the term subjective, I want you to think about the word subject, right? I want you to think about the word subject, meaning that it's going to be different from one subject to the next. Look at that, I'm artistic. Notice that it is conscious. It is part of your conscious experience and it's going to be accompanied by some form of bodily arousal. It's going to come with some sort of expression in a physical sense. Something that I like to mention to both students and people who work under us in practice where I work is anything psychological is going to have a biological, physiological foundation, whether it be genes, brain, um, um, trauma, physical trauma, there's going to be a factor. Chemicals, brain chemicals, drugs, there's always going to be a biological factor. And emotions are not different. Now, an emotion doesn't occur just because it occurs. There are different components that lead to emotions. Let's talk about the cognitive component. Let's talk a little bit about the cognitive. Now, generally, one of the ways that we look for that cognitive component is through verbal reports. Verbal reports. We can think about a subjective assessment, right? A projective assessment such as the TIT, right? That you saw earlier. Or we can use an objective measure. So we can use, say, for instance, the Beck Depression Inventory asking a question directly. And the intent is so that I have the ability to understand what that client and that patient is experiencing. Now, this term is immensely important. And I would say, particularly in practice. And why is that? Because I am trying, when I am trying to predict my emotional reactions, we refer to that as effective forecast. When I am trying to predict how is it that I'm going to react? What type of emotion am I going to have? For example, if I were to ask you right now, how do you think you're going to feel if you were to fail the exam? You get a zero of 100. Right? So notice that some of you already have a general idea. Some of you may say, I'll get really angry. I'll get really frustrated at myself. Some of you may say, I'll get angry at you or that great right? Which is typically the case, right? It's typically the case. Now, one of the issues that we have with the presentation of our emotions is that we very, very consistently, very reliably, we tend to mispredict. We tend to mispredict our effect. How is it that we're going to react to an event? We tend, we have that tendency of not being able to show that prediction. And you're thinking, why is that relevant? Like, why is that relevant? 
Think about a patient who is showing up to you because that individual, right, that individual, that client is facing a divorce. So you have this male client and they say, well, I think that when I signed those divorce papers, I might as well just commit suicide when my wife presents to me those papers next week. And this is a real life example. This could happen. And part of her job is trying to change that prediction, trying to change that emotion, that cognitive component of expressing that. Part of your job is the confrontation of those emotions so that we can change it. Any questions about the cognitive component of emotion? But let's move on into our second component of emotions. Right? Let's talk about the physiological component. So this is our second component for an emotion. And in the sense of autotomic arousal, this is simply your physiological arousal. And it's going to occur basically in your autonomic nervous system. And if you recall from our previous lectures, you'll remember that we have our autonomic nervous system and our parasympathetic nervous system. Our autonomic system is that that becomes aroused whenever we are exposed to a stimulus. So for example, if I were to see something elongated, right, something dark, for example, my first interpretation of this cable here, right, perhaps my first interpretation with my autonomic response is that is a snake, that is dangerous. So I'm going to have physiological reactions to that. My heart is going to start beating. My lungs are going to start expanding. I'm going to start breathing really hard. My pupils are going to become dilated because I am seeing this as a potential threat. Now, because of that, there is, there is a connection. There is a connection between physiological response and that of emotions. Now, Generally, whenever we are considering a polygraph test, we are thinking about a polygraph test, think about the assessment of that polygraph. Simply, what that polygraph is trying to do is notice if there is a connection between emotion and that arousal. What a polygraph is trying to do is determine a connection between emotion and that arousal. A lot of individuals try to ascertain that a polygraph test would be a good measure for detecting if a person is being deceitful, if a person is lying. The problem with that is that notice that a polygraph is only looking for that autonomic arousal, right? It's not necessarily interpreting that deception because I can become scared. I can start breathing heavily. I can have my pupils dilated because I have an investigator right here asking me about a crime. Not necessarily because I am lying. Now, yours truly, your dearest Dr. Schoer over here has had a couple of polygraphs. Not because I did anything bad. Everybody here is looking like, say, what? what you do, right? I had a top secret clearance when I was in the military. So we had to undergo polygraphs all the time just to make sure that I wasn't doing something that I wasn't supposed to, like say, for example, selling top secret clearance, uh, top secret information to our enemies, for example. So I had to undergo polygraph tests uh, in a few times. So part of that is, are they actually noticing deception or are they simply looking for that emotional response that I simply just have about this guy asking me if I've been hanging out with terrorists, right? Which is the question they will legit ask you, right? But in a more, um, less theatrical way than your dear instructor over here. Now, how is it that we are able to interpret that information, right? Well, we have neural circuits. Think about the hypothalamus, the amygdala, and both of them are going to be next to each other. And that is what we like to refer to as the limbus system. And within the limbus system, we are looking 
at the seat of emotions, right? I need you to remember that just because I say that there are brain structures that deal with emotion, it doesn't mean that they're the only brain structures that deal with emotion, or it also does not mean that other parts of your brain are not involved in the emotional process. So for example, in order for me to see the threat of whether or not this is a cable or if it's a snake, I need to use my eyes. Therefore, I need to use my occipital lobe. So notice that that was also a component to interpret whether or not this was a threat. I need to see it, right? So notice that we also use other brain structures. Interestingly, one of the things that I love talking about is the amygdala, the amygdala. Now, the amygdala is super small. It's a very small structure. Now, one of the big, big purposes of the amygdala is that it allows for that emotion process, particularly with conditioned fears. If you recall from our previous lectures, when we were talking about conditioned, we are talking about something that we have learned, something that we have associated that initially was neutral, right? But we started pairing that neutral stimulus, if you recall from our previous lectures, and we're pairing that neutral stimulus, and now what we're doing is pairing it with something that perhaps in this specific case induces fear. So think about some individuals are afraid of going and using an elevator or an escalator. Notice the elevator per se is not fear inducing. It's just a metal box, right? It's just not fear inducing. But notice that this fear became conditioned. There had to be an instance in where this metal box that was neutral, notice that now it was paired with another stimulus, another presentation that has led to fear. And therefore, they're both together. Say perhaps now you have a phobia, now you have a, an, an irrational fear, an unjustified fear. Because you know the elevator is not going boom, right? It's not actually a fear-inducing object. So we could argue that the amygdala assisted you in that process of having a conditioned fear. Any questions about that? Good deal. Let's talk about another component, another, the third component of an emotion. That is behavior. Every time I hear the term behavior or every time you hear the term behavior, I want you to think about what could I actually record, right? What can I record with a video camera, with your cell phone, with that camera up there? Behavior is anything I can record. Notice I can record depression, can I? I can record depression, but I can record someone being alone in the room every day. I can record someone crying. I can record somebody overeating. Any hands? <laughs> right? I can record someone not eating. So that will be a behavior that we have understood that we can interpret as depression. But notice that a behavior is something I can observe. Now, we express our emotions based on our behavior, verbal or nonverbal, something that I could record. Maybe you know that an angry person, perhaps, Nonverbal language is, for example, they turn around, they are disinterested, they're not engaging. Notice that we're not actually recording the emotion of anger because we cannot, but we can record the expression of said emotion. So, for example, somebody punching a hole in the wall. This is immensely important because you will have a lot of patients in real life and in practice that do not understand the difference between the two. They don't understand the difference between behavior and emotion, the differences in these components. If you ask them, well, how do you know your wife was angry? Well, she was angry because she went to the room and didn't talk to me all day. Well, for all we know, she had a headache, right? So notice that not necessarily that behavior can reflect that specific emotion. Now, 
Something that I would like to mention is one of the things that we use to inform facial, to inform our interpretation of emotions is facial and the facial expression. Now, generally, one of the basic, basic emotions that we tend to view in a facial sense are happiness, sadness, anger, fear, surprise, and disgust. Generally, in this specific case, these are the basic six emotions, basic six emotions. We generally derive other emotions based on these six aspects. So whenever a person, I, I like to ask my clients, what exactly are they feeling? And then they'll say, well, I'm angry. Okay, so what's angry? Because to me, angry is yelling at someone, right? I'm angry, I raise my voice. But for a client, that might not be it. A client gets angry, they may say, walk out and leave the person talking to his or herself, which generally tends to work really well, right? You just walk away, like, <laughs> right? That's to work really well. Now, there is such a thing, there is such a thing as the ability for us to recognize emotion in a cross-cultural sense. Why is that? Our recognition of emotions, our facial expression, are innate. We are hardwired. We are born into expressing certain emotion, right? A good way to understand that hypothesis is that we have facial feedback hypothesis. What is the facial feedback hypothesis? That is that we're going to have facial muscles and the movement of set muscles is going to send specific signals to the brain so that the brain is able to recognize the emotion that one is experiencing. I'm actually going to give you an example of. So notice that in this specific case, we have the ability, that contraction, that relaxation of your muscles. And here we have our basic six emotions. Notice that in this specific case, your contraction or relaxation of said muscles is going to lead to the interpretation, the signals that you're going to send to your brain in order to interpret a, an emotion, right? So for example, if we zoom in a little bit, notice that in the sense of happiness, which muscles tend to attract and be released, surprised. Whenever we are experiencing fear, whenever we are experiencing disgust, and of course, the lighter the color, less activation. Anger, looks like we show anger a lot through our eyes, huh? And sadness. Notice that the expression, based on this hypothesis, what it's trying to show is that the contraction of muscles tends to allow us to interpret emotions. But you're saying, well, hold on. Blind people have emotions. And they don't see people smiling or doing a number with their eyes because they're surprised or they're angry. But notice that because it is innate, it is an ability that we will show, a blind person doesn't need to see another person in order to smile when they are happy because it is an innate ability. Notice that even though these are our basic six emotions, Generally, the ones that do stand the cross-cultural examination are fear, disgust, happiness, and anger. These four emotions can stand the test of being shown in different cultures. So what I'm trying to say, anger looks the same here that it would in Africa, that it would in Asia, that it would in, say, the North Pole. Anger is going to be recognized irrespective of any cultural interpretation. The same is true for the rest of the other 
three emotions. Any questions about that? Good deal. Good deal. Now, what we're trying to do when these basic cross cultural emotions, what we're trying to do is we have found that the cognitive appraisal, that cognitive appraisal that we are doing can help us in the interpretation or engaging in certain emotions. Now, we don't have much evidence to show that those differences in culture have that impact with the emotional experience. Notice that we have been able to substantiate somewhat this hypothesis because there are cross-cultural similarities and we cannot justify that it is indeed cultural differences that allow us to interpret said emotions. Any questions about that? Does that, does that also apply to sadness and surprise? So the issue is that the data is not necessarily that reliable with other emotions. So, so far, the ones that have indeed been really, really reliable, let's use that term. So for example, when we are thinking about fear, right, in the United States compared to say other cultures. So let's think about, let's see, let's think about Chile, right? When we're thinking about Chile, we have an agreement at about an 85% that if we show them a face of a person that is angry, irrespective, and they're in the very bottom of the Americas, and we are in North America, even though we're so different culturally, we're still able to recognize the same face. Now, that type of consistency, you may not necessarily find it for the other emotions. So generally, you're only going to find it for happiness, anger, fear, and disgust. Generally, it's a little bit difficult to find that reliability with the rest of those, for example, sadness and surprise. So there could be some similarities, but it's not. Right. Personal. Right, so for example, when we're thinking about anger and let's see, we're thinking about anger and let's look into, well, anger in Argentina here in the United States compared to Argentina is only 54 level of agreement, which is still better than chance. Right, it's still better than chance, even though barely, it's yeah. just barely better than chance. Right. Now, there are some differences to continue with the, with the question. There are some variations, right? There are some variations in how is it that we observe and categorize specific emotions. So there are some cultures that do not even have a word for sadness, depression, anxiety, or remorse, right? And that's something that I've learned firsthand because whenever I am talking to, I do speak Spanish fluently, although the army seems to think that I, am, I have professional proficiency in Spanish, not native proficiency, and that hurt my little my little strings. <laughs> I thought I had complete native proficiency, which I still think I do. But whenever I have a client, I tend to, I do have clients that prefer therapy in Spanish rather than English. And I have learned that there are a lot of emotions that I know how to explain and define both textbook and colloquial. I am able to define it as a good, good old American woman but I am not able to define them in Spanish. And I came to realize those words simply do not exist. There are some words that simply are not there. So sometimes one of the limits that we have in recognizing emotions can simply stem from not even having a word, not even having a word for this particular aspect of this particular emotion. Now, another reason why we may have some differences in culture is display rules, display rules. Now, display rules are simply those cultural norms and what is considered appropriate expression of emotion. You're thinking, well, if I'm sad, I'm sad, regardless if I am white, black, Asian, Middle Eastern, African, I'm sad. So if I'm sad, I'm sad. The issue with that is that we are taught how to express our emotions. And because we are taught how to express our emotions, 
they're going to look different from one culture to the next. So for example, we can even think about gender, right? So generally, when we are thinking about a stereotypical cultural norm, we're thinking about a female is only allowed to show her emotions through crying, right? Whereas males are generally only able to show their emotions through anger, right? So if a female is sad, we generally expect her to cry, or we generally expect her to become depressed. But whenever we have the idea of a male being sad, oh, he's super sad, he just punched a hole in the wall. So notice that cultural norms are going to give us an idea as to how is it that we present our emotions. So for another culture that views a male punching a hole in the wall, they may say that person is angry. Whereas here we can say he's angry or maybe he's sad. He just doesn't know how to show that emotion. Well, he does know how to show it. It's just he's been taught that that is the appropriate way of showing it, getting in his car and strip out of the driveway, right? Those are the differences. And because of those differences, it might be a little difficult to start interpreting said emotions. Now, generally, they tend to be more prevalent and more intense. So generally that expression tends to remain prevalent. Those emotions that do not fit the cultural ideals, notice that they're going to be less intense. So for example, think about males and crying, right? Males and crying. Generally, we don't associate males with crying. If I were to ask you in the beginning of the class, I want you to think about a person that is super depressed and crying. Generally, the first thought that's going to come to your head is a female. Because if you are an average American person from an average income household, from an average place, generally that's what we've been taught. If I ask you right now, think about a nurse. The first thing that's going to come to your mind is a female, more than likely. And if I ask, think about a medical doctor, generally you're going to think about a male wearing a white coat. Why is that? Well, because those cultural ideals that we have, if your emotion fits that cultural ideal, is more likely that it's going to be more intense, it's going to be more present. Whereas if it doesn't fit, right? For example, a male nurse, although we do have male nurses, we do have female physicians, but notice that it's going to be less prevalent, right? And that is simply part of our cultural expression. So any questions about that? Good deal. Let's talk about the theories of emotion. And remember, every time you see the term theory, I want you to think about explanation, right? A lot of people tend to um, have and confuse this term. They think about theory as a guess or a hypothesis, and that's simply not true. A theory is a body of evidence that we use to provide an explanation, right? This happens because of this, right? So, and we explain, it, right? So that's what a theory is. And we do have the James Lounge theory. And this perspective is actually pretty neat because what happens is that we have a conscious experience. So he's trying to explain why is it that we have emotions, right? So let's think about the conscious experience. Let's go back to that example that I gave you of me becoming emotionally aroused if I were to see this cable, right? Now, James Lange theory, what he would, what we would propose is that those different patterns, right? Those different patterns of my autonomic activation, that is what's going to lead to my emotion, right? So whenever I saw this cable thinking it was a snake, notice that that conscious experience that I had, I'm going to use that conscious experience to inform that autonomic nervous system and my autonomic system is going to tell me my heart's racing, I'm breathing hard, my pupils are dilated, therefore I must be afraid. So that is how we would explain emotion through James Lange theory. Because of his theory, what we tend to observe, what we would expect is that we would have the ability, ability bless you, we will have the ability to distinguish emotions 
based on that configuration. So if in that configuration, I see this table thinking it's a snake and I add dilated pupils, I add heart racing, I add hard breathing, that configuration of those physical characteristics is going to inform my emotion and say, I must be scared, right? So that is one aspect, one mean to explain emotion. We do have other means, right? And that is the cannon bard theory. Cannon bard theory. What the cannon bard theory proposes, how is it that we explain behavior? What it proposes is that we're going to have notice that it's a little different because we're moving away from that conscious experience. So now we're going to go directly to that physical arousal. And what, can, what this theory proposes is we are able to have physical arousal without the experience of an emotion. So how is it that that occurs according to this specific theory? Well, the proposal, the explanation is whenever we have an emotion as that that is processed through the thalamus, the thalamus is going to send a signal simultaneously, not one after the other, notice that it is simultaneous, to the conscious experience. Notice that in this specific case, we had the conscious experience that resulted from that physical arousal. Right? So my heart's racing, my breathing, my pupils, therefore emotion. Whereas with the cannon bar, what we're trying to say is emotion occurs at the same time of that conscious experience, right? That conscious experience and that autonomic expressions, for example, your pupils, right? Your heart rate and your breathing and your pupils. So basically the order is a little different with the cannon bar theory. Now, let's look into Shester's two-factor theory. Now, this theory attempts to explain emotions in a different fashion. Notice that emotions through James Lange, they propose that conscious experience came from that arousal, right? So we had that arousal that led to my emotion. Whereas Ken and Bart says, no, they occur simultaneously. And that's how you interpret your emotion. That's how you end up having that emotion. Well, according to this theory, he proposes that we have two factors, right? We propose that we have two factors. We are looking into situational cues to distinguish between alternatives of emotions. So I'll give you an example. In keeping with our table, right? I can say I'm going to have fear, right? Because I am seeing this case and I'm going to say it's a snake. But notice that according to Schatzer's theory, what's going to happen, I'm going to interpret this situation based on perhaps two options because of my situational cues. I'm inside a classroom that, you know, it's really clean, you know, the grass is not overgrown. So the chances of there being a snake here are pretty low, right? It's not to say there weren't, but you know, there's no chances, but I'm going to differentiate between two potential emotions, right? So for example, I can say, I can become afraid when I view this cable because it's a snake, therefore I should become afraid. Or I can say another emotion is me feeling silly, right? Because I would expect a cable in a classroom, right? So, oh man, I'm silly. That's not a snake, right? So notice that I have two factors in order to provide an interpretation, but in order to distinguish whether or not I'm going to pick being afraid or I'm going to pick feeling silly because I thought it was a snake, I'm going to use my situational cue. If I were in the middle of the woods, probably a good assumption is there's no cables there, therefore, probably a snake. I should be afraid. Whereas here, we're not in the middle of the woods. We're in an air-conditioned, very clean classroom. So notice 
that according to Shaster, I'm going to use cognitive interpretation. I'm going to use cognitive interpretation. Notice that that was very, very short. It was a very, very, almost immediate, almost immediate interpretation. With me distinguishing whether or not this cable is a cable or a snake. Now, it's relatively similar, relatively similar to James Lange because we are going to infer our emotion from arousal, right? Just like James Lange proposed. We are going to have that interpretation of emotion because of our arousal. So that they have in common. It also agrees with Cannon Board because the position that different emotions may have may be indistinguishable. Remember that Cannon Bard says they occur simultaneously. So they're perhaps indistinguishable from one another. Basically, the two-factor theory, what it's trying to do is to reconcile both of these theories, saying they don't necessarily work independently, rather they work together for us to be able to interpret and have emotions, right? Be able to both, how do we look for external factors and internal cues and being able to be more specific about the emotions that I have. So any questions about that? Did you go back to that previous slide? Yes, sir. So the James Lane uh, theory is essentially there's a stimuli, there's autonomic response, and then we pull our emotions from how are we react to that. Correct. And then Cannon Bard is the opposite. Correct. Instead of saying one happens after the other, Cannon Bard says, no, they occur at the same time. Whereas James says, no, you have an arousal, you have an emotional, or I should say physical response, and that's what you use to inform it. Whereas here in the Cannon Bard, they occur simultaneously. So this is immensely useful for therapy because sometimes I'll have individuals who, um, say, for example, suffer from panic attacks, right? So in their case, you know, say, for example, their stomach starts hurting, um, they start hyperventilating. So part of my job is to change that interpretation. Sure, we can think we're about to have a panic attack, or we can use it as this is the time to start meditating. This is the time to change that interpretation. So we can use this in therapy for sure, because it would be a good way to help the person distinguish between those emotions and, and changing that interpretation. And this here is actually a really good example about that. This actually is a, a, a really good response. So notice here we have the fear inducing, right? Here's the fear inducing. I would try, I have a bad back. It would be really difficult for me to run, but I would try though, if I see something like this, am I right? So let's look at James Lange theory. I feel afraid because I tremble. So notice that because you have a physical response, that's what you're going to use to inform your emotion. So basically we have the physical response and then we're going to have an emotion. Now cannonball is not one occurs after the other. So one and two. With Cannon Bard, what we're trying to say is that physical reaction, right? That physical reaction comes along with the emotion, right? So the physical reaction and emotion are simply one and the same. So they occur at the same time. Whereas with Shaster, what we try to do, what we try to do is that we are trying to appraise that situation, right? Where there is an interpretation, right? There is a form of interpretation. You are trembling as you fear. So notice that that sounds an awful lot like Cannon Bard. And notice that there is a interpretation, right? Just like you would with James Lange. So notice that it's a way to reconcile both theories. Any questions about that? It's actually a, a really good illustration for that, for sure. Really good illustration. All right. Now, let's think a little bit about how happy are people? Let's look about at 
what people deem as happy. You'll be very surprised. Half the people that you will see in therapy will tell you, you ask them, why are you here? What brings you to therapy? And about a good chunk will tell you, I want to be happy. Or I've never been happy. Or I want to be less sad, right? So generally, you're going to get something really similar along those lines. The thing is, happiness, of course, is subjective, number one. And number two, let me tell you, nobody's responsible for your happiness. And that's a really hard thing to accept. My wife makes me happy. My boyfriend makes me happy. My kids make me happy. They don't make you happy. That's not their responsibility. Your responsibility is to engage in your own happiness. That's why you go to therapy, to learn things like that. So, but that's really difficult for most people to accept, especially in therapy. So notice that we have also subjective well-being. And remember, every time you see subjective, I want you to think about the term subject. It's time to make a lady. There we go, for my art majors around here. Notice that we're going to have an individual perception of what is your overall happiness. The vast majority of people report being neutral. The vast majority of people will report being neutral. Generally, that well-being stays, stays relatively the same across your lifespan. If you're not engaged in any sort of trauma or things of that nature, whatever state of homostasis, if you will, the, the state of being content, it's going to stay about the same. It's relatively stable over the course of your life. Now, how is it that we are able to predict happiness, right? Well, generally, higher levels of happiness, right? So we are thinking about the extreme, right? So we have sadness and so extreme sadness, extreme happiness, right? Notice that in this specific case, some, factor are, some factors are social relationship. For example, friends and romantic partners, things of that nature. Another factor that we can use to predict happiness is how satisfied are you with your career? How satisfied are you? Notice that I didn't necessarily say how much money you make. I said, how satisfied are you with your career? So for instance, I love teaching. I could do this the rest of my life because I absolutely love it. And I really like learning and listening to students' uh, questions and and me being able to share what I know or what I don't know, right? But notice that that doesn't mean, you know, I make a million dollars a year working here. It means that I am satisfied with what I do. And that can be a predictor for happiness. Another aspect is physical health. Physical health is another predictor that we can utilize to ascertain whether or not a person will define his or herself as happy. Notice that the vast majority of people, when they go to therapy, they want the extreme. That's what they're aiming for. They want, they want to say, I want to be happy. I want to be happy again, or I want to be super happy. The vast majority of individuals are not in the extreme. The vast majority of individuals are going to be in a neutral. Actually, let me fix that. Let me change it a little bit. The vast majority of individuals are going to be in the more neutral aspect, right? They're going to be in the neutral aspect. Most individuals are not immensely sad and most individuals are not immensely happy. Notice that in this specific case, most individuals are content. Most individuals are not happy. Most individuals are not sad. Happiness is say for example the day you got that letter saying that you were accepted to your college the day you got married the day you graduated the day that you had your kids that's happiness that's extreme joy whereas when you're just content it's a general state of well-being so most clients are shooting for the extreme most clients are shooting for an extreme state of happiness instead of shooting for content they show up to therapy like this and they want to go to this without going through the content aspect. And of course, that is an unrealistic expectation 
And me as their provider, I need to bring that up because we need to go through that middle process. And sometimes that is as good as it's going to get. And we talked about the three main predictors of happiness. Let's talk about weak predictors, right? They are still predictors, so notice that they're still predictors. But those of you who've taken statistics or research, or when you do take statistics or research, you'll know that we have predictors that have a correlation of, say, 0.2 or a correlation in R of 0.3. That's what we mean about a weak, a weak predictor, right? Whereas these three predictors over here, they could be strong. So for example, 0.8, the closer a number is to one when you run your statistic, uh, the stronger it is. So we can have a 0.9. So notice these are better predictors, whereas these could be weak predictors. Money, money is a weak predictor, right? For general, let's see, for general happiness. People can only make so much money until money doesn't matter anymore. Right. So a lot of people say, well, <laughs> what's that song by uh, Ariana Grande? Whoever said money didn't solve their problems must have not have enough money to solve them. I love that song, by the way. I love it. But notice that it, that is incorrect. Why is that incorrect? Because money can only help so much. Money can only help so much. Generally, I think after a person starts earning I, here in America, by the way, I think it's 75 or 80,000. After that, money starts becoming meaningless. It doesn't turn into a strong predictor, then it starts becoming a weak predictor. Notice that it will not necessarily be a contributor to happiness. Age and parenthood, age and parenthood. Generally, a lot of individuals say, well, when I was younger, I was happy. Or some people say, now that I'm older, I'm wiser, for, for instance, and now I feel happier. These are also weak predictors, right? They may not necessarily contribute as much when we are looking into our previous predictors, such as social relationship, career satisfaction, or physical health. Intelligence and attractiveness. If I just were, if I were prettier, maybe I can start dating and therefore I could engage in this. You would be surprised how many times I hear something like that. If I were smarter, if I were more attractive, uh, fun little fact, the smarter you are, the more likely you are to be depressed. So ignorance is in the bliss. So the smarter you are, the more likely you are to be sad, by the way. Fun little fact. So when your grandma said ignorance is bliss, she was right. Ignorance is bliss because intelligence is a good predictor, matter of fact, for depression. Look at that. Go figure. Now, health, not necessarily physical health, but health in general, may not necessarily be a strong predictor. It is a predictor though, but it's not as strong. It's a weak predictor. How much social activity you engage in is also a weak predictor of happiness. For example, some people say, if I were to hang out at the club, you know, every Friday and Saturday, I'm good. You can only hang out at the club so many times before you're not happy anymore, just like money. You can, only, you can only have enough money and then money starts becoming a weak predictor, right? A weak predictor. I heard someone say, I heard someone say a joke about this a very long time ago and they said, well, that's true, but it's easier to cry in a Rolls Royce than it is a bicycle. And I'm like, well, you're probably right. I mean, it is easier to cry in a Rolls Royce than it is a bicycle, but you're still crying, which is the point. It's still not providing you that, that happiness. I remember hearing that way a long time ago when I was um, an undergrad. It's like, yeah, true, but you're both crying, isn't it? You're both crying. And then the last thing that I would like to talk about is religion. So let's note religion, for example, is a weak predictor. We do have evidence, for example, that religion can be a good predictor, say, for example, as a coping mechanism, right? Because people can find refuge when it comes to religion. Another aspect about religion, particularly in the therapeutic sense, is that consider that you're going to have a sense of community, right? Because you're going to this place where people have the same train of thought as you do. So yes, it could be used as a strong predictor for happiness in the sense of social relationship and coping mechanism. But then when you're thinking about correlations, so for example, an R 
of say, for example, nine, notice that it's not a good predictor for that correlation. Any questions about that? <laughs>